Alleluia, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Cross as we worship on this seventh Sunday, seventh Sunday of Easter. Uh, just a heads up, next Sunday is Pentecost, and so uh, I invite you to start thinking about the red that you'll wear. That's the tradition on Pentecost is to wear red. As we gather this morning, we acknowledge that we're on the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and the peoples of Treaty 7, the Nitsitapi people, and the Nakota people. We do this land acknowledgement to remember, to respect, and to hope for continued re reconciliation. Let us begin our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We may live 
Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 1. One day Peter stood up in the midst of the believers, a gathering of perhaps 120. Sisters and brothers, he said, the saying in scripture uttered long ago by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David was destined to be fulfilled in Judas, the one who guided those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and had been given a share in this ministry. It is necessary, therefore, that one of those who accompanied us all the time that Jesus moved among us, from the baptism of John until the day Jesus was taken up from us, should be named as witness with us to the resurrection. At that, they nominated two, Joseph, called Barsabas, or Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, O oh God, you can read the hearts of people. Show us which of these two you have chosen to occupy this apostolic ministry, replacing Judas, who turned away and went his own way. Then they drew lots between the two. The choice fell to Matthias, who was added to the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The appointed psalm for today's worship is Psalm 1. Graham and I, and Jack, would like to present to you a setting of this psalm written by Maurice Green. He lived from 1696 to 1755, and although you may not recognize his name, at one time he was the most important musician in London, where he simultaneously held the four most prestigious posts of the day, organist at St. Paul's Cathedral, professor of music at Cambridge University, organist at Chapel Royale, and master of the King's music. 
we would like to sing for you this beautiful setting, but we ask that you keep in mind that in the early 1700s, inclusive language wasn't a thing. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. We accept the testimony of human witnesses, but God's testimony is much greater. And this is God's testimony, given as evidence of the only begotten of God. Those who believe in this one have this evidence within their hearts. Those who don't believe God have made God a liar by refusing to believe in the testimony given on behalf of the only begotten of God. The testimony is this, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in the only begotten. Whoever has the only begotten has life, and whoever does not have the only begotten does not have life. I have written all this to you who believe in the only begotten of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel today continues um, the readings from the Gospel of John. That's part of the farewell discourse. We've had a few weeks of this, which is Jesus really, uh, wor- it's Jesus' words to his disciples there on the night before he was crucified. Today's reading shifts though. Uh, instead of talking to them, it's a prayer for them and hence a prayer for us. So here now the gospel, John chapter 17, beginning with verse 6. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus prayed, I have manifested your name to those you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and now they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you've entrusted to me does indeed come from you. I entrusted to to them the message you entrusted to me, and they received it. They know that I really came from you. They believe it was you who sent me. And it's for them that I pray, not for the world, but for these you've given me, for they are really yours, just as all that belongs to me is yours and all that belongs to you is mine. It is in them that I have been glorified. I am in the world no more, but while I am coming to you, they are still in the world. Abba, holy God, protect those whom you have given me with your name, the name that you gave me that they may be one, even as we are one. As long as I was with them, I guarded them with your name which you gave me. I kept careful watch, and not one of them was lost, except the one who was destined to be lost in fulfillment of Scripture. Now I am coming to you. I say all this while I am still in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I gave them your word. And the world has hated them for it because they don't belong to the world anymore than I belong to the world. I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but to guard them from the evil one. They are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Consecrate them, make them holy through the truth, for your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. I consecrate myself now for their sakes, that they may be made holy in truth. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Back when I was about to enter the uh, inner grade 11, my family moved from Arkansas to Austin, Texas, and um, started living with with my cousin and quickly fell in, not fell in, but he invited, invited me into his group of friends. And almost from the moment I got there, uh, I mean, I was going, went, started attending Westlake High and um, everybody at Westlake High talked about the folks at Austin High. That was the nearest high school. And uh, there was nothing good that he ever said about Austin High. In fact, they called them the River Rats because they were right down there by, by the Colorado River. And of course, they, uh, in response, called us the Rich Westlake Hippies. And so there, there was just all this talk about, uh, about the Austin High River Rats and, and how they were no good and, and I was in the band and how their band was no good and all this kind of stuff. And... Um, and then one evening, I was out with my friends, I think we were at a restaurant, and we ran into some people from Austin High. And my friends were nice to them. Started talking to them and found out they were in the band and they started talking about music and things like that. And I was so puzzled, so mystified, because these were the enemies, these were the people we hated. And here they were being nice to them. This was certainly not the beginning or the first time I'd been exposed to this kind of us-them orientation. But it certainly continued my inquiry to kind of understand this dynamic that it just seems to be so a part of our lives. That from early on, we're kind of taught who is us and who is them. And I come from Texas, of course, there's Texans and everybody else. (laughs) 
But then at one point I moved from Texas to, to California. So I was like, am I Californian now? And then I married a Californian and we moved to Texas. And of course in Texas we talked about being Americans and then there were those Canadians up there. I mean, this is only a small sampling of the us, thems, these kind of divisions that that we create, that we divide up uh, using labels, using various criteria. Of course, a lot of this was about where I lived uh, and the identity came from that. But of course, there's also the kind of the, the ethnic, our ancestries, our skin colors, our the way we speak, uh, uh, different occupations, different social strata. I mean, the list goes on and on and on as far as ways that we divide ourselves, that we kind of identify who we are against who they are, who I am against who they, who they are. As uh, in the last few weeks, we've been hearing Jesus' farewell discourse to his disciples. And there are... Um, some of it's kind of hard to keep straight because there's some words that are used over and over. Jesus is always talking about God being one and Jesus being one and one with the Father. And so there's this kind of oneness conversation along with lots of talk about love and also an inclusion of the disciples there. And in today's prayer... Uh, the gospel reading is a prayer. It really is a, I, I would summarize it as this. It begins with a prayer of acknowledgement of the oneness of God and that Jesus and God are one and that we are invited into that oneness as believers in God. So there's a, a connection, a oneness that we have with God that expands then to a oneness that we have with each other, the disciples, Christians, the church, and then expands to a oneness, an invitation to unity and connection with the whole world. And this is a completely different orientation to look at the complexity that is the world to begin with oneness and unity. But I think it's core to what Jesus, why Jesus came, and what God is up to in the world. God, for God, there is no them. God represents the unity of all. And God invites us into a, a, a way of viewing the world that begins with an acknowledgement of the connectedness of the unity, of the relationship we have with all. And it's most exemplified in Jesus who, we've talked, you know, you may have heard about people who never met a stranger. Jesus never met a stranger. Jesus always saw another, really another extension of himself. Call it sibling, call it cousin, call it friend. Always through Jesus' eyes, in essence, and also God's eyes, was just another one of us. And as he modeled that for us, he invited us as Christians, or invited those disciples, but also as believers, to recognize that as ones who recognize who Jesus is and who, how, and, and, uh, how Jesus points to who God is and represents who God is. That there's a oneness that we have. There's a connection. We are an us through Christ. And that us is intended to be a movement that invites other people to see and recognize and to claim the unity, the oneness, the connectedness of all of us. Um, just this last Tuesday night, we, I was reminded of the foreign exchange students that we, uh, Pastor Laura and I, and well, and Paul and Matt, have have hosted over the years. Um, I mean, I think there's six, well, there were six of them from Taiwan and Israel and Jordan. I hope I don't miss any. Anyway, Mont Montenegro, uh, Germany, and Finland. And there was always an interesting. Uh, 
process that happened with these foreign exchange students and a little bit with us, but primarily with them. Because the aim of the program is not for them to come show us how to live. <laughs> it was for them to come and experience, kind of to adapt to the, to the culture, to the way of life that we lived and to experience that. And of course, there was, there was certainly some adaptation that we made as we introduced uh, these young people into our household. But there's something really eye-opening that happened with each one of them. And also I've experienced when I've gone and traveled to other cultures and lived there long enough, is that there, you realize that people are people. People are people. They want to make sure that they can eat, that they can drink. They want to know who they are. They want to belong. They want to be able to love and be loved. They want to figure out what their purpose is. They want to make a difference. People are people. And as we invited these foreign exchange students in, into our lives, I mean, we experienced it over and over. Initially, they were a they. <laughs> it just felt, I mean, we didn't know them. But as soon as we were able to let down our guard or whatever the transformation we needed to, they became one of us. And they all refer to us now as our family. And we are blessed they have family in Finland and Taiwan. Well, our Taiwan students are here in the U.S. now. But Germany and Jordan, those other places. <coughs> other places. This is kind of the sense of, I think, of what Jesus invites us to. That Jesus is about this being able to see and claim and live into this connectedness that we all have. That there really aren't us and thems. There's just ways that we've learned, th things that we've adopted that make us feel separated. That make us feel like some people are us and other people are, are them. And on one hand, it sounds wonderful. I mean, we capture with the words love. Love, love our neighbor as ourselves. And love seems like an easy thing to do. I'd say it's actually hard work. Because we have so many ways, so many criteria by which we are so eager to identify someone as, another, as an other, someone who is not us. And to work and really live into and claim that connectedness and be part of that movement that God is up to, to have us all recognize that we're all in this together is hard work. And it has two primary dynamics. And there, I'm going to use very religious words. Repent and forgive. Repent and forgive. I'll start with forgive. Because when we think about, you know, uh, all of us being one, and wouldn't it be wonderful if, if we all got, just got along in the world, immediately comes to mind people who have demonstrated a desire to hurt or harm us. And it raises the question, what do we do about those people? How could people who are out to get us possibly be people that we are connected with and claim as siblings, as cousins, as grandparents? From the perspective of beginning with that we're all already one, I like to use the word trapped. People are trapped by the fear, by the way they've been trained, by the, their experiences that, that, that some people, it's safer. They need to regard them as others. And they're trapped by that. Like in the story about uh, <laughs> when I was uh, calling Austin High people river rats, I was... It's like I'd, I'd been trapped by that mindset that they were them, that they were enemies, that they were, were people that we need to work against and hate. And it, fortunately, my, my friends had a much more mature understanding of it. And they, and they showed me that that was just a simple rivalry. But I had to unlearn that. And there's so many things I need to unlearn because people who talk differently, who, who look differently, who act differently, immediately I, I start reaching for categories and there are people that are trapped by that who see me as an enemy 
because of where I live or by the way I look or the way I talk, will and can act out in harm. And when that happens, in order to be part of God's movement in the world, to connect us all and have us experience the joy of this relationship with God, with each other, and with the world, it takes forgiveness. It takes a willingness to say, I trust that there's a oneness here. And I also recognize that this person is trapped. And to then forgive them for the way they are acting out of their fear, out of the way that they've been enculturated. So also, there's the work of recognizing the ways that I've been trapped. The ways that I still put people into categories and make quick judgments and decide that some people are worth my time and other people aren't. That some people are of value to me and other, others aren't automatically saying this person is a threat and this person is not. All these us-thems that, that just are automatic are things that get in the way, that separate me from my siblings, from my cousins, from my grandparents, my, the non-biological ones that represent everyone else in the world. It's at the root of this, I think, is fear. And in the gospel, it says that uh, Jesus prays, I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but to guard them from the evil one. And I think it's this spirit of fear that has us so trained and so quick to set up these separation, these barriers, these walls to, quote unquote, protect ourselves or to gain power over whatever that is. That really is the evil. That's what we need protection from. Because it takes a step of faith. It takes courage to choose to love and instead of giving in to fear. This is Jesus' prayer for us because the prayer begins that Jesus' joy may be made complete in us. When we do the work of of repenting and forgiving, of forgiving and repenting, we have access to the joy of that Jesus has, that Jesus had, that God has. This joy of being able to see God's presence in everyone that we meet. The joy of being freed from these automatic things that keep us trapped in more and more fear. The freedom to get curious and to be wonderfully surprised as we uh, meet and make friends or claim the friendship of people uh, that we never would have thought we had anything in common with. There is a joy there as we discover that the world is not an angry, evil place motivated and uh, empowered by an angry, wrathful God, but that the world really is a friendly place and that the source The grounding of it all is a God that seeks love and relationship and grace and desires that for all of God's children. This strategy is really is a call to an ever-expanding us. (laughs) It begins with our family and sometimes we have work to do there because we have decided that our parents or our brothers or sisters or other folks in our family are not us anymore. Something's happened. And there's a barrier and that spirit of divisiveness, that, that evil spirit of separateness has broken it, up, broken it apart and seeped in. There's forgiveness and repentance to do. And we begin with our family, continue with our friends, acquaintances. Who knows, maybe someday we'll even be friends with folks in Edmonton, as Cal- Cal- Calgarians course I'm joking but this this sense of recognizing all the ways that we're trapped by our separateness and noticing it claiming it repenting and looking for ways to experience the joy of the connectedness that God calls us to Jesus prayer is that our Jesus joy may be made complete in us 
through repentance, forgiveness, through seeing and recognizing, we are set free, truly set free to love and truly set free for the abundant life, the abundant life full of joy, living the relationships in this world that God has given us. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Holy God, in Christ Jesus, the joy of the church is made complete. Root the church in your word and unify us as Christ's body. Send us into the world as your loving people, ready to testify to your spirit at work. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Mighty God, the world is your handiwork, displaying your creative impulse. Seize team with life, forests reach up to praise you, and the mystery of life lies deep in the soil. Guard and keep this world for the well-being of all your creatures. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Gracious Sovereign, those who follow your ways are like trees planted near streams of water. Establish the leaders of nations and all in authority in your grace and truth. We especially pray for the leaders in places of strife, Israel and Palestine, Yemen, Ukraine, Hong Kong. Strengthen and guide them so that they may work for peace and abundant life in those places. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Generous Savior, you befriend those who are sick, suffering, poor, lonely, outcast, rejected, or sick. Grant healing and love to all in need. You hold the, family, you hold the lives of all who suffer in your hands. In this time of pandemic sorrow, in comprehension and tragedy, help us stand together. In this crisis, bring your mercy and healing to the sick and your health and strength to all who care for them. We especially lift up those for whom we have been asked to pray. Gemma, Dave, Yvonne, Gil and Elsie, Lynn, Ella, Edie, Dirk, Lorna, Sheila and Jim, Marlene, Bill and Ruth, Devona, Zella, Lorne, Eric, Ruth, and Alan. We also lift up those who are mourning. The Sanders, Thomas, Wright, Kerbison, Sandham, Stevenson, Sorensen, and Craven families. Give all of, <coughs> all of these people tangible signs of your steadfast love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, here in this community we share the gift of praying, learning, and supporting one another. Give us thankful hearts as we claim the gifts that are unique to us and keep us from being envious of others with different gifts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For what else do the people of God pray? Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Saving God, your wonderful promise is the gift of eternal life in Jesus. Through the witness of those who have died in you, strengthen us now in this gift of life. We cherish the memory of all your saints. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I uh, invite you to, if there's folks around you, to share a sign of, of God's peace or to send peaceful thoughts to people that uh, are on your hearts and minds. Uh, yeah.
Send thoughts of peace. We continue to thank you for your generosity and faithfulness in this time as we uh, continue to worship virtually. May you find sustenance in that which you need during this time. Let us now hear a musical offering. Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will, will be done, done on earth, earth as, as in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Just a brief reminder that we will be gathering at 11 a.m., um, uh, this Sunday morning for communion, followed by fellowship time and sermon talk back. If uh, you can access this uh, through the worship worship page on our website, uh, we call it the Zoom prayer room, and that's the way to, to join us for that. A blessing. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus, the God of life. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Justice.
Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.